Howdy YouTube and welcome to this episode of The Gunman. So this video here, I'll be taking you guys through my preparation techniques and methods for waterborne paints, specifically the Chromax Pro range. So I'm gonna start off by showing you guys my brand new Chicago Pneumatic Orbital Sander. Spray Guns Direct were very nice to send this one out for me so that I could do a bit of a demo on it, but also mainly just to help me out because I wanted my own sander and the ones that they had at this shop when I got there, they were sort of starting to sound like chainsaws and getting a little bit old. So I just decided, you know what, I'd like to have my own. Anyway, I thought I'd give you guys a quick look at what they come like in the box and making a point to if you ever do get a new orbital sander, make sure you keep those tools because they're a specific tool for each sander. You might look at them and say, oh yeah, well I've got another one that was from the Dyna Braid that I got. It'll most likely be a slightly different size, so you'll yeah struggle to get that pad off in future when you do need to change it. Over time, those Velcro pads do wear out. Sometimes they can end up getting warped, depending on how aggressive you are with the sander and how much use they get. But anyway, all we're going to have to do is put our air fitting in there and put some oil into the back of this uh, tool. Now, I recommend not over-oiling. I'll, I'll probably only oil it once every two to three weeks, and even then, it is literally just one drop. You don't want to put too much in. What will end up happening is all that oil will end up coming out the exhaust and spitting onto your panel. Now, I made a point of showing you guys these pads here at the start. You can go back, hit pause, and get a product number if you like. But what they are is 1,000 grit pads. Now, I've found that they are better than most of the other ones on the market anyway, the ones that I can get locally here in Australia. Some of the other ones, are, they're just garbage. Like, you'll get half a panel done, and then they're just useless. You'll have to go and grab another piece. So sometimes, the cheaper products end up working out more expensive by the time you put an overall cost into that job. If you've used five of the cheap pads or one of the expensive ones, it's most likely going to be cheaper all over to use the more expensive ones. So as you can see there, I've got my trolley all set up. It's got everything I'm gonna need to prepare a car. So I can just wheel that up to a car and I'm not walking up to the storage area every time I need a new piece of sandpaper. So I think that's a very good idea to have for any painter these days. I never used to have them, but it's probably a good idea to have. Uh, it definitely saves a bit of stuffing around. It's neat and um, yeah, makes your life a bit easier. So the job we're gonna be preparing today is just a Toyota Camry, a hybrid version. As you can see there, there was a couple of badges on the guard, so I ripped them off with a metal applicator. Obviously being careful not to scrape into the paintwork because that is a blend area. If it was getting colour over it, you may get a second chance and uh, you'd be able to knife those scratches up and put a bit of colour over there. But obviously, just being extremely careful. Then I used the rubber wheel, got rid of all the double-sided tape, and then I got my air blower and blew off all the residue left behind. I've then got some wax and grease remover or prep sole in that bottle there and wiping off the little bit of residue that was left behind underneath. So just making sure those panels are nice and clean. Now, I will be doing dry sanding techniques the entire way through on this job. I find dry sanding a lot neater, a lot cleaner, and a lot quicker for myself. So what I've done here is switched over. You can notice that I'm using a different atomizer bottle here, and this one has a mixture of 50% water and 50% methylated spirits. Just your standard methylated spirits from the hardware store. What this is gonna do is remove any water-based contaminants, so mud, dirt, anything like that. If it turned out that this car was covered in tar and oil and anything like that, I would have used the prep sole first or the wax and grease remover first and then maybe gone over it with the water-based cleaner, but it only really needed the prep sole on those areas where those uh, little bits of double-sided tape were left over just to give it a final clean. Now, I will say this again and again, cleanliness is next to godliness, so just Keep it clean and it, it reflects a lot about yourself. If you've got bits of sandpaper all over the ground and the, the job's just a mess and you just walk up to that and just get your orbital sander, you don't even clean the panel down first, well then it, it's going to show through in the final, uh, the finished job. When the job is painted, you, yeah, you're probably gonna get a messy job with junk and stuff all through it. And yeah, I never used to be like this. I used to be a little bit more messy around the workshop, but in the last couple of years, I've uh, moved up and found the benefits of being that little bit cleaner. 
So what I'm doing here is just getting the compressed air again and just drying it off because uh, the water obviously takes a little bit longer to dry. Now the methylated spirits in there is actually going to help it. It'll actually help it vap off. Now it's a little bit cold over here in the Perth at the moment. It is our winter at the moment, which is a bit of a piss poor winter. You know, you're talking about 16, 17 degrees every day. So it's not really that cold. Uh, yeah, by international standards but by per standard it's cold so it's taken a little bit longer to dry if it was the middle of summer it would probably be drying straight away once i'm happy i've got the exterior panels nice and clean and dry i'm just using that old rag to just give those interior edges a bit of a wipe it's going to help me when it comes to the final clean down and ready to mask stage there'll just be a little bit of dust there a quick wipe down and i'm not going to be filling that rag up with uh, mud and dirt and stuff like that so going around these edges now with a bit of three quarter inch tape or 18 mil tape. Uh, you can use two inch or 36 mil if you like. I am pretty experienced with the orbital sander and I'm confident that I'm not gonna be hitting the surrounding panels with 18 mil tape on there. So as you can see here, we do have some dust extraction systems, but they just don't fit half of the orbital sanders. Look, nobody uses them in this workshop. I would actually like my own little vacuum cleaner that I could bolt to the side of that trolley, and that would just uh, really give it a good upgrade. Um, it's, it's not the biggest deal. We do have a full dust extraction fan system down there, and you may have noticed that down there. So it's actually not a very dusty workshop. The shop I worked in last year, you, most of you guys I'll be fairly familiar with that my own workshop that was so dusty you could put something down and with an hour it would just have a massive layer of dust all over it but this is a good one um, I'm quite lucky to be working in a well equipped workshop uh, it had been let down a little bit prior to me starting there but I'm starting to uh, bring the quality of that shop right up again and just stay on top of the cleanliness and stuff like that anyway into our sanding so I've got the orbital sander that was a 5 mil on that Chicago new Matic sander and I put the interface pad so that's just a foam pad that sits in between the hard pad and the piece of sandpaper so I'm just starting off with 500 grit I could go 800 grit but I'd find I'd use twice the amount of bits of sandpaper and for the sake of an area that has got a little bit of orange peel in it like that bonnet I'm only going to be using one maximum two pieces of 500 grit I'll then go over that with one or two pieces of 800 grit and you've used uh, less sandpaper and you've also got that uh, orange peel knocked out a lot quicker than if you were to do it with straight 800. Gone are the days of getting a piece of grey scotch bright, a bucket of water and some scuff stuff and prepping your blends up that way. Uh, I find that I like to remove most of the orange peel, at least the visible orange peel, so that uh, you've got a nice flat surface to paint over. I think that the quality and the standards of work are a bit higher than what they used to be. Well, the shops that I started in anyway, I was just taught, yep, get that bucket of water and off you go, make a mess and uh, just uh, prep the panels up that way. I find that doing it dry also, it's easier to see what you have and haven't sanded. If you've got a big layer of water over the entire panel, you haven't really got much of a idea of what has or hasn't been sanded. Half the time what used to happen is you'd get it all prepped up, dry it off and then you'd find oh there's a couple of edges that haven't been done and you'd finish it off dry anyway so it sort of defeats the purpose. Uh, I, when I started doing my dry sanding techniques it felt like at the start it feels like oh this is taking forever but then before you know it it's just done, you know. Uh, so yeah, just spend that little bit of time at the start to clean those panels down prior to even touching it with a piece of sandpaper. Make sure you blow it down in between each stage. So I've done 500 grit here, then I've got the air blower, I've blown it down, I'm able to inspect. As it turns out on this car, there was a little bit of damage there. It was only really slight damage. It just chipped the paintwork. So I've had to go over and mix up some fine filler and put that into those scratches. Not a big deal. There's also a few stone chips in the bonnet and I'll be fixing them at the same time. Even if there was, say, a repair on the corner of this bonnet, I still would have fixed those scratches. I don't like painting over chips and scratches and dents or anything like that. You may have noticed that the panel bed has left the headlights in prior to me starting this job. At the very start, you may have noticed the headlights were in. Obviously, went over and made sure they removed them. The way I see it these days is that the owner of this car, he's probably paying around $1,000 a year in insurance. They've paid to have their car fixed properly. They deserve to have it 
fixed properly. Don't just get stuck in the rut of, oh, well, the panel beaters didn't pull it out. It's not my fault. I'm just going to run a piece of tape around it. Sometimes it does get a little bit frustrating in a body shop environment when the cars get bought over to you half done. They've missed dents. They've not taken things out. But, yeah, especially when you're really busy, you know, uh, to me, it just seems sometimes like, why have you even bought it over? The job is half done. If I was to just, say, paint the bonnet and not do the blends on this car and just send it back over there, well, I'd be in shit. It'd be like, why didn't you do the blends? But for them, it's like they just half finish a job sometimes and just send it over. Uh, so I've been getting onto them a bit lately, sort of been giving it to those panel beaters a little bit, taking the job sheet over and saying, mate, can you not read or something, you know? Uh, you guys may not get the full uh, idea of what I'm actually like as a person through these videos. I'm just the same as anyone. I get frustrated. I get pissed off. I've got a workload ahead of me. And when there's other people slowing me down, I hate it. It's my pet hate is if I'm ready to start on a job and it's not ready, it's just, it really pisses me off. And it's like, well, okay, so I've got to take the car back over there. I've got to wait for another half an hour. And then by that time, I, I may as well just start on the next job. So, you know... If, if it's at the point where, oh, that car just has to get into primer tonight, I'll just, I'll follow that job through tomorrow and take those headlights out. But it wasn't even the case. It was just, no, nah, I'll just half do my job. I'll take the bumper bar off, send it over, and, um, yeah, worry about it later when it comes back or when there's a masking edge there. But at the end of the day, everything stops with a painter. If I paint over dents, even if it was the panel beater that was meant to do them, it stops with me because at the end of the day, I'm the one that's gonna have to be redoing it. So yeah, there's a good old saying in this trade, a good painter will make a bad panel beater look good and vice versa. You know, a bad painter can make a good panel beater look bad. At the end of the day, it does stop with us painters. Obviously, there's some things like remove and refitting, you know, if they break a molding when they take it off, well, that's out of our hands, but enough of that. Anyway, let's continue on with the job. So I'm using the Phoenixa 2K Polyester Fine Filler. It's quite a good filler, this one. Phoenix have got some good and average products. We use quite a lot of the Phoenixa stuff because the shop I work in is partially owned by Carcraft and Carcraft own Phoenixa. So some of their stuff is really good. Some of their stuff is average, you know. Uh, their sandpaper, I would say it is mediocre. I, w I mean, I wouldn't say it is terrible. I wouldn't say it is awesome. It's middle of the range, you know. It's, it's usable, usable. My boss gets it at a really good price, so I'm happy to use it. Um, anyway, uh, when I'm putting that fine filler in, I like to get it in nice and tight. So obviously making sure that there's enough still into the chips, you know. You don't want to go and wipe it in totally dead flat and you'll find that it might may actually be sitting a little bit below the surface. You then go and paint over it and there'll be a little bit of a low spot left there. Now with these fine fillers, most of them anyway, all the ones I use, you can actually paint straight over them. You shouldn't have to use any uh, primer. You can if you like but it's not absolutely necessary. I'm also always very cautious not to put too much of that uh, hardener in because you can actually have it bleed through your paint or even through primer. Like if you've done a repair and over hardened it, it'll bleed through the primer, bleed through the base coat and through the clear coat and you'll still be able to see this big section. I've seen it happen a few times. There's actually a good little fix for that. If you get some red oxide, so just base coat, red oxide, straight tinter, thin it down at your normal ratio, put that over the section where the bleed through is, repaint over that, and it won't show through. Now, that was with the red hardeners. I'm not sure if that's gonna make a difference with some of the blue hardeners that we use these days. Hey, it might even work just to put a coat, a base coat blue over it and then continue on with your color. I'm not sure, but I can say 100%, if you do get those bleed throughs, the bog bleed throughs, uh, it's very rare that it does happen, but it may come in handy for one of you guys one day. So as you notice, while that filler's drying, I had a quick look at the color. It turns out it was a little bit on the yellow side, so I put a little bit of blue. Needed a touch of that effect white in it, so it's crystalline frost in the Chromax Pro. It's just like a frosty, bluey, uh, white tinter, so I put a touch of that in, a touch of blue, and uh, did another spray out. So that's up there drying in my color card box while I am gonna prep these blends up. So I've put 800 grit on the orbital sander now and prepping these blend areas up. You notice that I 500 grit over the front section of it. That was mainly so that any stone chips that may have been there would show up easily. And if I do get a cut through up that area with the 500 grit, it's not the end of the world. There's gonna be color up that area anyway. 
but I don't want to cut through up those back areas. It's very important. Now, I actually had my apprentice, uh, it was just yesterday, I prepped up a full side and a front on a Nissan Dualis, and I said, hey, let's do this job together. We were sort of starting to get ahead of on our work, had a bit of time to spend with him, and I just said, look, just stand there and watch me. He, I think he thought I was sort of joking. I'm a bit of a joker at work, have a bit of a laugh and stuff like that. But I don't know if he quite thought I was serious. And I'm like, no, man, you'll be surprised at what you'll be able to pick up just by watching me. I'll take you through every step. I'll tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing. And at the end of it, I told him, I said, did you see anything that I did there that looked hard? And he said, no. And I said, it, it's not hard. There's nothing that I'm doing that is hard. But at that end, end result that you see there, if you can do that, you're painting next week. He's a first year apprentice. I said, you get your prep, prep work right, you'll be painting in no time. But until you can get that prep work right, you won't be inside that booth. Or you might just get to paint white 2K bumper bars. So when I'm doing my prep work for water base, the basic methods stay fairly similar to everything that I did for solvent. I just go that next stage finer. So if this is a solvent job, I'd actually use 600 grit or fly, even 500 grit. The light metallics are the ones that you're really gonna notice that, that bit more on, but I still just use this same prep method over every single color these days. Uh, I like to keep it fairly uniform. There are a few differences that I will do. Now, so I was explaining to my apprentice yesterday when I was blocking the black dualis down, there was a couple of repairs that I knew were good, they only needed to be blocked with 320 grit. There was a couple of other ones. I started blocking with the 320 and there was still a few ripples there. So I said, look at this, see? That's why it's hard to teach you guys just a one method for every job because this part here, I need to hit it with 180 grit. But because I've used 180 grit on the block, I'm gonna have to go 320 grit on the orbital, then 500 and 800 for a final sand. Now you can actually paint over 500 grit as long as that's your base coat area. You really need to go 800 for your blends. But I just give it a really quick buzz over the 500 with the 800 grit for a final sand, even on the base coat areas. It doesn't take that much longer for a bit of peace of mind, especially on these lighter metallic colors. If it was a dark black or something like that or a blue, you get a second chance. Like if you get your base coat color down and you can see a very fine sanding scratch, you just be able to jam a fat coat of clear over the top of that and you won't be able to see it. Yes, it is something that down the track will be able to shrink back into those sanding scratches. That's why you're better off just going that little bit further, especially with this water base because uh, it dries down to a lower profile than what the uh, solvent base does anyway. You're putting less coats of it on and you are left with a lower film bill with the waterborne paints that I'm using here anyway. That may vary from uh, product to product if you're using your PPG. I'm unfamiliar with that system. I've really got no clue what that stuff sprays like. I've heard it's actually quite good. I'm really enjoying using this Chromax Pro and I'm starting to absolutely nail it. I was having a few little mottle and blending issues. I think I've overcome them lately. The next couple of jobs will definitely tell me that. I ended up finding that I was better off using a little bit of water in the base coat blender because that base coat blender was actually changing the color at just a little bit, enough for me to notice the blends anyway. I personally take as much pride in my prep work and my masking as what I do in the final application of the paint. And if you don't, well then, yeah, it's, it's a full package spray painting is at the end of the day. Apart from polishing, I stay well away from that. I absolutely hate it. I was tortured as an apprentice and made to polish everyone else's jobs, as most apprentices were. I'm not saying that that was uh, anything worse than most apprentices, but by the time you get to yeah, a tradesman, you absolutely hate it. Um, and then even when you do get to the stage of an er in your early trade, well for me personally anyway, you still had to polish your own jobs. So that pushed you to get those jobs that little bit cleaner, less polishing, less of that crap job that everyone hates, more paint work. So yeah, and it starts from this section right here. When you're doing your prep work, get these jobs nice and clean in the prep work, make sure you don't cut through on those blends and then you know, you've know you got to put color right up over the edge and risk a bit of a color difference over your blend area. Keep yourself, your work environment, your spray booth, your tools, everything nice and clean and that will follow through to the end result. 
So this is those Merca Abrilon sanding discs, those 1000 sanding discs that I showed you guys at the very start of this video. Uh, as I say, you probably could uh, swap this for a piece of grey scotch bright. However, I, I don't like grey scotch anymore. It's, it's rare that I ever really even use it. Even on bumper bar prep work, I'll just grab one of these things. Give it a quick scuff back. Some of the paint reps will tell you that you don't even have to sand a new bumper bar before you paint over it or before you adhesion promote it. But for what it's worth, it only takes best part of one minute to give it a really quick scuff back. And that way, if the paint does come off or it flakes off, you can say, hey, look, I followed my personal procedure. It's sanded underneath. I put the adhesion promoter down and it's still flaking off. But look, the truth of it is, it's extremely rare to have that kind of thing happen anyway. Most of the time, if it does happen, it's just been someone did an adhesion promoter. They didn't put their plastic primer down anyway. This is where you'll probably notice that it's very important to get those panels nice and clean, especially all those edges like underneath the wheel arch and stuff like that. So if that still had dirt and grease and mud and stuff, I would actually end up picking that up on my sandpaper and then I would end up dragging it over the rest of my panel when I go and sand the rest of it. So yeah, it's very important to do stuff like that when you go and drag all that shit underneath the rest of the panel well then you may miss it in your final prep sole or something like that you go and clear over it and you're clearing over mud and dirt now this is a stage here that I must admit I don't usually do I was mainly doing it for the purposes of this video just to show you if you would like to go to the next stage if you do find that you do get a few sanding scratches you can whack that abrolon disc onto your orbital and then give it a final orbital so that will uh, yeah probably just take it to that next level from the 800 right down to 1000 over your blend areas you can actually also, I've heard some people say that they use that waterborne cleaner, just a slight amount of that waterborne cleaner, which is that methylated spirits and water mix that you saw me using at the start to pre-clean the panels down with. So if you like, you can finish it off that way, but to me, that's sort of, that's wet sanding, using water. And when you've got it on the orbital, it's going to start flicking that water all over the place and just start making a bit of a mess. I personally don't do it. So now I've got all those blends ready. I've came back for these bits of filler and it turns out they're dry now. I've just got a 320 disc on that sanding block and just giving it a block down. Just making sure I keep the block flat. It's pretty important. Now there's probably been a few stages here that you've seen me use the orbital sander on a bit of an angle, but you make sure you keep it moving. Obviously making sure I wasn't digging into any specific area more than any other. Keep that orbital sander moving. I actually left a lot of the audio in that section, mainly so that you guys could sort of get an idea of the speed that I was using on it. So I left the control on flat out and I was just feathering on the, uh, the trigger on the on and off the accelerator I guess you could call it on that orbital sander so you, you may notice there that I didn't actually fully block it right out I, I'm gonna finish that off with the orbital sander with a bit of 500 grit so I, I do need to get rid of those 320 grit scratches if I was to go and paint straight over that I would have sanding scratches in my base coat and then you'd have to sand that back with say some 800 or some 1000 grit and then reapply more base coat and that's just a total pain in the ass so I did use 320 grit on those so that you, you you need a bit of cut in it. Like if I was to go with 500 grit, yeah, you'd probably get there sooner or later. For starters, it would take longer, but you wouldn't actually cut through those top layers quick enough. You would find that you may end up with a bit of a high spot where the filler was rather than um, blocking it down dead flat as I'm finished off with. And that's where it's pretty important to get that filler in nice and tight, as I said at the start. Um, sometimes for stone chips, all I do is just get the orbital sander and just buzz them out without blocking them, as long as you've got that filler in nice and tight. So that's 500 grit there. I'm just feeling it to make sure there isn't any low spots left there, and then going back over it to get rid of any of the oils that may be on my hands that I might have uh, rubbed over it. That's something that I'm always... Uh, very careful of. Uh, I don't like, once my panel has been prepped, I don't like anyone walking up to my job and leaning on it with the oils out of their hand. It's probably more uh, critical with the water-based paint because uh, you'll get some uh, yeah, sweat and stuff like that coming off your hands and you can have some reactions in your paint work. With your solvent-based paints, it may, well, from my experience, it may not be so critical anyway. So anyway, uh, they're getting the 800 grit to f give it a final finish off with. Give it another good blow off, give it a wipe down with prep sole, then we're ready to mask and go inside the booth. So I've been pretty impressed with this orbital sander so far. I've been using it for probably about a week and a half now. Um, Spray Guns Direct were very kind to send it out, as I mentioned at the start. And look, it's probably not up there with the Dyna Braid. 
It's a little bit slower than some of the other orbital sanders I've used, but it's definitely fast enough to get the job done. It's not anything that's really going to slow me down a great deal. The way I have seen it always, though, is that you can slow down a fast orbital, but you can't speed up a slow one, you know? And, yeah, as I say, it's, it's not slow, slow. It's just that little bit, maybe just a couple of RPM slower than maybe the Dynabrade. But at the end of the day, you get what you pay for. That sander, I think, was around the 200 Australian dollar mark. So, look, I'm at the point in my life where I, I'm trying to save up and get ahead in life. I want to get myself into the uh, housing market sooner rather than later. So, you know, that extra 150 that I would have uh, spent on the diner bread, I'd sooner have that in my savings, earning me a bit of interest. Anyway, now the prep work is 100% done. We've just given it a really good blow off. As you can see, there's not even a great deal of dust there because I was keeping it clean in between each stage, made sure I kept myself clean, blow myself off. That's another thing that they say, like when I was working in the mines and when you go to trade school, they'll say you're not allowed to use any compressed air to blow your clothes off. Look, in the real world, I have to. I'm not, I can't just throw my spray suit on with dust all over myself, you know? I've been doing it for the last 16 plus years and I'm still alive. The main thing I think is if you've got to open, if you get air into your bloodstream, it goes to your heart, you're gonna die. In the real world, I'm yet to see anyone die from blowing themselves off. Sometimes I feel like I'm gonna die if I don't have someone blow me off. But anyway, that's another issue, maybe for another episode. So I've found it's a good idea to wipe my jobs down with wax and grease remover. So you can see I've got that atomizer bottle with the wax and grease remover in it and wiping that down prior to masking. Again, making sure I don't touch it with my hands too much when I'm masking. And then I'll just give it a final waterborne cleaner before I do my paint work. Now, they do recommend that you wax and grease remove and then waterborne clean. That's the recommended procedure by the Chromax guys, the paint reps around here anyway. So that's just to get rid of any um, yeah, oil-based contaminants, obviously. So give it a good wipe down and there is not one cut through that goes through to bare steel. There was one or two right on those edges that go through to the primer but that's not gonna be an issue at all, as long as it's not back to bare metal. If there was any cut throughs to bare steel, I'd make sure I put a little bit of primer over it before I paint over it because of the waterborne paints, uh, obviously water and metal equals rust or corrosion. Another thing I'd like to make a quick mention of, I just remembered that on the edges of most panels, you'll get a little bit of a buildup of clear, sort of like a bit of a sausage on those edges. So uh, you may have noticed earlier in the video, I made sure I got rid of most of them because if you go and paint over them, then they're under your paint and you can still see them, especially on the light metallics. So um, yeah, I like to get rid of them, but without cutting through to bare steel. I decided to include a little bit of the uh, paintwork stage on this car just to finish the video off. I've recently told you guys that I'm gonna be giving away 12 of these gauges, six through YouTube, three through Facebook, and three through Instagram. Now this is where you YouTubers get the opportunity to win one of six of these regulators. All you have to do is in a comment below, just say the gunman 2820 in a comment, first six comments will win. It's as simple as that. I will know the first six people that make that comment because it will show up in my comment section through the back end of YouTube. So T-H-E-G-U-N-M-A-N-2820. Write that in a comment below for your chance to win. First six will win. I'd like to say a big thanks to Spray Guns Direct for making that competition possible as well. That's about it for this video, guys. Hope you've enjoyed watching. I've definitely enjoyed making it. Stay tuned for more giveaways in the future and loads more paint tutorials. Thanks for watching, and this has been another Gunman production. Oh, and don't forget to get out there and paint some shit. Gunman out.